Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Good to see everyone. We uh, spent the last week up with my folks in uh, Moni, just around the corner. And uh, it's always neat to celebrate uh, the holidays together as a family and see how big that family keeps getting. Um, I think somebody counted up that we had 59 people come through the house on Thanksgiving Day and uh, we went through 15 pounds of potatoes for mashed potatoes in one day. So, All right, if you'll turn with me in your Bible, we have, um, we're going to be going to the book of Acts, uh, starting at verse 26, and we'll go through verse 40. I don't typically think of the book of Acts as an Advent um, reading, but... Uh, as I was preparing for this back in August, I just kept coming back to this passage. And um, it's about Philip and the Ethiopian. And I like to think of Philip as one of the chaplains of the Bible, sort of showing up when and where needed. And um, one of the families we worked with, I worked with, overnight one night, um, they unfortunately were going through a bereavement and they had their own clergy come out uh, on very short notice. And they were from northern Ethiopia, a country that's now Eritrea. And um, their clergy came out and they wore floor-length cassocks and blazers over the cassocks and round hats and went in and prayed in a different language and anointed the person's body with oil and with water. Things that we do in Christianity, things that we have seen before, but in a different language, it was so foreign. It was so different. It was such a different perspective for uh, the staff, that everybody afterward was asking, me, what religion are they? And in all the different um, colors and vestments and language, the, the staff hadn't noticed the giant table-sized crosses, table crosses which they carried. So I said, well, I think they're Christians, given the giant crosses they're holding in their hands. And uh, they were Coptic Christians. Uh, so it's funny how seeing familiar things in an unfamiliar place or done in an unfamiliar way can just totally throw us. So I want to come and look at this passage of Acts in an unfamiliar way and read it as if we're reading it for the first time together. Uh, so with that, let's lift our hearts up and ask the Lord to illuminate his word to us. Lord... We come before you and we ask you to open your word to us. We ask that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears, that we could read wonderful things, that we could hear wonderful things and rejoice with you as we celebrate Advent together. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And Acts, it says, Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the, road, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so Philip ran up to this chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, do you understand what you are reading? How can I? Said, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before him, the shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. 
Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came near some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. The word of the Lord, and God always blesses his word to those who hear. So here, sandwiched between Simon the sorcerer and Paul's conversion, before Paul leaves Jerusalem with breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, we have Philip, who gets a message from an angel. And is sent on his way. It's a strange Advent reading. Advent is typically a time where we gather together and we remember the waiting that has been done. The waiting for the promise that was given to Abraham, that was planted in Isaac, that grew in Jacob, that seemed to dissipate during the time of captivity in uh, Egypt, that Moses led out into the wilderness and then to the promised land that grew in David and eventually saw its completion in Christ, that redemptive history that Jesus himself opened up and showed to the disciples on the road to Aramea when he told them about this very passage and others, and he showed them all of redemptive history and how the promise was not just a land for God's chosen people, but was salvation for the world. And that's what brings us here. That's why we light these Advent, calen uh, these Advent candles. Don't light Advent calendars. Just open them one at a time. Um, that's why we do that. We remember that time of waiting that was so long. And then we anticipate rejoicing at the beginning of that promise that was seen in the birth of Jesus Christ. That grew in Christ's age, in his life, and his ministry, and his miracles, and his suffering, and death on the cross, and his resurrection, paying for all of our sins. The ultimate act of love from God himself coming down to earth, becoming one of us. And so, Philip meets the Ethiopian as he reads this passage about Advent. The Ethiopian had come to gather and celebrate much like we do. He went to Jerusalem to celebrate one of the Old Testament feasts. He also went to learn and we know that the Ethiopian was very rich and very powerful because he had his own scroll. He had a chariot that presumably wasn't driving itself while well, he read. Um, and he was the treasurer in charge of all of the queen of Ethiopia's vast treasure. A very rich and powerful and learned man. And he's sitting there perplexed, meditating on scripture on a scroll that he has, which was very rare in those days. So Philip was given a mission to go to this man whose heart was being prepared for him. Philip hears this message, this mission from the angel, go to the south, and he does. And when he goes to the south, he sees 
this chariot afar off. And he does what any insane person would do, or anybody filled with the Holy Spirit. He runs after a moving vehicle. And he catches him. And he jogs alongside, and he hears the Ethiopian reading out loud. And the Ethiopian does what any insane person would do, or somebody whose heart had been prepared by the Holy Spirit. And he slows down and listens to the question and either stops or slows down a little more and pulls Philip into his chariot. And they have a conversation along the way about what is the meaning of this scripture. Do you understand what this means? And Philip gets to teach what he had just learned with the rest of the disciples after Christ's resurrection. The idea of redemptive history. The working of God since the foundation of the world through to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he provides a baptism there because the Holy Spirit was working in the heart of the Ethiopian to receive that word. To hear that good news. He was there at the right time because God sent him and in the right place because he was shown the way and he spoke to the right person because he was led by the Spirit. I sometimes wonder if um, later, you know, the next passage is Paul's conversion, Saul's conversion. Sometimes wonder if Philip looked back at this incident and was grateful that uh, it didn't happen after Paul's letters were widely circulated and he didn't have to try and have a theological discussion about the works of Paul. It may have made it clear to Ethiopia had that been the case. I also wonder if the, the, um, if the Ethiopian ever wondered what happened to Philip after he was baptized and came out of the water and then was transported away to the north of Jerusalem and he continued sharing the gospel all the way up to Caesarea. Philip's work reminds me of chaplaincy. It reminds me of the kind of chaplaincy that I think we're all invited to be a part of, and that during Advent, we are all invited, particularly invited to be a part of. It's a season that has left its mark on the world, and it gets, it gets commercialized. There's no doubt. And it can be distracting and uh, pull us in different directions. But it's a time where people of faith, where Christians can celebrate this period of waiting that they've had and then rejoice because of the reality of the promise the reality of that salvation that's come to all of us. <clears throat> so many times in my work, um, like Philip, I get called, whether it's to see this Ethiopian family and help them get the supplies they need for their blessing the ritual to help them understand what happens in America after someone dies. Um, 
I can't tell you how many times I've been called to a room by uh, one doctor or nurse only to be told by another doctor or nurse that, well, I don't think the family's that religious. I don't think they, they need a chaplain. It's like, well, we help them understand what happens next and I'll go in and say, I understand you don't need religious support and that's fine, but I'm here to answer any questions you have about what comes next. And I can't tell you how many times that conversation has led to a deeper conversation. Usually I say, well, I'll step out. I'll be around if you, need any, if you have any questions, and I'll just let you have some time. And just as my hand touches the handle of the door, they'll say, um, excuse me, I have a question. And that question will often lead to a wider conversation of not only how do we physically leave this space, but how do we emotionally and spiritually leave this place. We had a family come in to us from the West Coast, um, a very wealthy family who was able to take a private jet to the hospital. Um, and I got there the first night when they arrived because it was uh, very serious. And I talked with the family and said, well, we're not really Christian. We, we don't have any religion in particular. And so we started talking about the different um, features of Cincinnati. They wanted to know where they could go, what was Cincinnati famous for. They loved good food, and they asked to know where to eat. And so we, we had a good conversation about that and about what it meant to be a chaplain in the hospital and exactly what a chaplain did because they weren't brought up in any faith. And um, they spent several days there. and We had conversations. I'd follow up and ask them, if they had gotten to go out and try different foods, if they had uh, been able to leave the room and take care of themselves. And um, one day I got a call that they would like their child baptized. And we got to talk about what that meant and all that was involved in that and what it meant to be a Christian. because they said that that was the only thing that helped them while they were in the hospital at that time. Having that spiritual connection, even though it was kind of alongside and, and not what you would typically think as a gospel sharing opportunity, even though the words were different, the presence of the Lord were there, was there and the Holy Spirit had prepared the heart to hear that. Another family I got called for in the middle of the night. And I was reminded of as I was preparing this sermon because I got a text from them. I get a text every year on the anniversary of the baptism that we did that night. And it was a little boy who had run into another one of his cousins. They had hit heads and he became very sick. And the doctors didn't think he would live because he was... Uh, his brain was swelling so much. And so the family, uh, grandma and grandpa were very faithful folks and they had raised their grandson, who was the child's father, uh, in the church. But he had kind of drifted away and his wife didn't even know, hadn't really had any church experience. And so grandma asked me to come out and talk about what baptism was. And we talked about how it's a sign of the working of the Holy Spirit. How it's a sign for people as children to become part of the promise of the family of salvation, of the family of faith. And for those who are grown-ups, it marks their commitment to Christ. And we talked about what that meant. I didn't quite go through all of redemptive history and start with the promise of Abraham. But we got to share the gospel and talk about that. And so we baptized uh, that little boy, he ended up living. I'm not saying it was because of the baptism, but a lot of people started praying for him. And we ended up baptizing him and his mother, who became a Christian, and his uh, cousins, who became a Christian through his testimony as they came to visit him. So one Saturday morning, we came and we just had the whole family come to our chapel and just 
baptized several cousins and mom and talked about the patient's baptism because he was so sick he couldn't leave the room. One of the funnier baptisms I did was a family in the NICU and the baby was intubated and it was for a family who was Baptist and they really wanted their child uh, to be blessed and, and they, they asked for baptism. And I came to the bedside and I said, well, this is no problem. We'll be happy to baptize. We baptize all the time. And I asked about their faith history and their beliefs and I prepared the water and Dad said, I just have one question for you. Is it safe to baptize them? It's absolutely it's safe. It's like, I don't know how you're going to do it. How do you take them with all the tubes and the leads and dunk them in the water? <laughs> now, we, we sprinkle. <laughs> this is okay. We can sprinkle. And then I remember times when I've been the Ethiopian and I've received the word of the Lord, when my heart's been prepared and God has sent someone to me. One of the earlier times I can remember was the first time I came to Family of Faith when, the, when uh, we still faced that way, which I think is roughly west instead of facing north. Um, and I heard about redemptive history for the first time. And what a difference that made to me and how much it changed the way I look at Advent and the work of God throughout the ages. I also remember the first chaplain's conference I went to where I just felt a sense of call and home and God had one of the elder chaplains be Philip to me and he came out and he introduced me to the rest. I don't even know if he was supposed to be paired with me. He just saw a new person, came, got to know me and then introduced me to the rest of the group. I was like, this is fantastic. This is exactly where I need to be. <coughs> so, as we get ready to close in prayer this morning, I want you to think about times when you have been called to be Philip, or you have been called to be the Ethiopian. You have been prepared to be the Ethiopian. And to look for those times and be sensitive to those times as we go out of here today and throughout the whole Advent season. Whose heart is God preparing for your ministry right now? And will you be able to respond? Be listening for the voice of the angel of the Lord? Or no, uh, I'm not asking you to chase any cars or to open your card to somebody who's chasing you. Um, unless you have a deep word. Um, but be sensitive to that during this time of Advent. And even if you think that your visit might not make a difference, or you think, what could I possibly add to this situation? So often I'm at the bedside and I Think of the words of um, Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address. There's nothing we can do in our humanity to solemnize this moment more. We don't have any power to add or detract from the holy work that's happening here other than our duty that God has called us to be here, to be in that place, to share in that joy or sorrow or fear or waiting with a person. So with that, I'd like to invite us to lift our hearts once again to the Lord. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Philips that you have sent to our lives. Thank you for the times you have prepared our hearts to receive the ministry of a Philip. Thank you for the hearts that you have prepared for us, for the Ethiopians you have for us to visit. Lord, open our ears so we could hear your call. Guide our actions so that we could respond when you have given us 
your charge, when you have given us a mission. Prepare the hearts of those to whom you would have us minister and guide our words so that we could share this wonderful news that we have, that we celebrate and we remember the anticipation of that salvation as we go through Advent and the culmination that we joyously celebrate in Easter. Thank you for Jesus, the promised one. Thank you for the salvation that he brought us, that he was fully human, that he came to earth, lived, suffered, died, was buried, and rose again. Thank you that we can share that with others. We pray all this in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen.